Casey McGlenn. I'm a painter, artist. Uh, I make music a little bit, but painting is my thing. Like that's how I live for the last 27 or 28 years. Right now we're in my studio in Sault Ste. Marie on Bruce Street, also known as the Drawing Club. And I live upstairs. Uh, me and my friend bought this building this past year for a steal. The Drawing Club is something I started when I moved to New York in 2005. And I didn't know anybody there. And so I, was, I had this great big um, space. And I was like, I'll host my own kind of like art night and get to know people. And so it was like my way of like making friends and stuff. And so I got to know a few people in New York and it worked really well and it became like this little thing. You know, it was only a few of us in the end, but like we were a little community and we had a lot of fun with it. And so when I moved here and um, I got divorced and I became single again, I was like, I don't know anybody. I got, I got to make friends. Like I'm lonely. You know, people come, we all collaborate, we paint together. You know, I kind of want to have knitters and people who make 3D models and like all types of mediums. And my ideal goal is like total mixed media mashup, you know, where it's just like, oh, I never thought of putting that with that, you know, and those kinds of things. Getting people who are really good at their thing come and like teach me and teach other people. Like, you know, I'm good at what I do. And so I want to teach that and they, I want to learn too. So that's sort of the model for it now. And so I think it can grow into something really cool because now I can have it every month, you know, forever but now that I own this place. And yeah, it's just sort of growing more and more each time we have it. There's more people coming out, people bringing like, you know, their, you know, people who are like, oh, like my, my son is kind of an outcast. He doesn't fit in at school. Can I bring him? I'm like, yeah, that's who we want. And like, it's open to people like that, which I think is a great resource to give this community but also like it's great for us to like you know see us when we were little and what we were like you know and remember and then those kids will be like shit there's people like me out here and you know and they're doing their thing you know and so I think it's a great like you know we applied for a grant and stuff but it doesn't matter if we don't get it because we don't really need money to do it and uh, people are starting to bring art supplies to it and stuff so it's sort of already self feeding itself, you know? So it's a really good natural thing that's happening, you know? And this couldn't happen anywhere but the Sioux because like, you know, where else can you have this kind of space to do that? And there's a big drug problem in any city, but the Sioux has got it fucking bad. Like the Sioux is like teeming with this fentanyl sort of epidemic. And like, like I had my trip, like a guitar stolen out of my trailer and I found it on Craigslist Marketplace or Facebook Marketplace. And I went to the place to get it back. And I saw the most fucked up situation ever where it was like, you know, kids under 20 sitting on couches all fucked up, like on fentanyl, man. And like there was a guy in a chicken coop who was like giving the kids the stuff. There was a lineup of like girls that looked like they were like 15 years old going to get the shit. And I was just like, this is some third world craziness here like this you don't find in Hamilton this is fucked up border town shit and so that's like that's unreal like that has to be talked about and you know some you know the drug problem here is insane and you know people have to start facing it in a bigger way like we need to have you know programs where and safe spaces for people to do drugs you have to start with that yet you know like it's I don't know there's so many so many levels to it that I I don't even know where to start but like the drug like epidemic here is out of control and like people have to face that like the people in the suburbs and shit who don't get their building broken into five times in a year they have to understand like this downtown shit is gotta be straightened out I don't know as the decades have gone by you know, the middle class has kind of like drifted into like, there is no middle class now. It's like upper class, lower class kind of lifestyle. And so the people at the bottom have got it even worse now. 
they have nowhere to strive for even. I kind of got into art because I was like suddenly making a living at it, making money at it. Didn't even realize it was a thing that you could make money at. Like I never even bought canvases until I had already sold a few paintings and I bought them at a garage sale. And like I wouldn't have been able to afford them otherwise. And I remember for like 80 bucks, I got like a few large canvases like this and did my first sort of batch of paintings. And it was like really, you know, that's what got me realizing, wow, this is fine art. You know, like I can sort of mask myself as a fine artist, like pretend to be that, you know? And like, then I became it. In my uh, house on Dovercourt Road in uh, Toronto, and all my roommates were artists who were sort of like better than me. And I was sort of like the novice and everybody knew that I had no art history knowledge and knew I didn't know much. Like, I remember they'd laugh at me because it was like, isn't Van Gogh the guy who had like a blue period? And they'd be like, that's Picasso, Casey. And I, like, I had no real, you know, art smarts like everybody else did. Like they knew who like Joseph Boyce was and shit like that. I had no idea who any of that was. And so there was this one night where I was like literally using like a piece of my um, roommate's like paper and using their supplies and they were all up in bed sleeping. And I remember I drew this animal like with four legs and then um, it was a sheep. And then I sort of did like the wool was like, um, I don't know if you ever had like a plate of spaghetti and then there's your sauces on the plate when you're done and you like draw in the sauce and you like make this sort of three dimensional woolly looking line drawing. So the wool was like that. I sort of had this pictograph style where I was like, I did like a little painting here and a big painting here and a little one here. And the, they were all animals. And when I looked at it for the first time, I thought like, this is art. Like I, and I saw, I sort of remember sort of being like, oh, I'm an artist, like my friends here in the building, you know, and they were all asleep. And I remember even thinking like that night, I was like, I'm, I'm being born into being an artist tonight. And that actually is what happened. Like I accepted myself and I had, that was me finding my voice kind of. And it was the animal form that sort of led me to it. Like I remember earlier in the day, there was a big cat fight up front of my uh, house. These two cats were like wrestling and fighting. And before I drew this, I had drawn these cats and it sort of got me into the four legs, like a four legged thing. I remember years later, I was like, you know, doing my art for a living and shit. And I was in Holland with these um, patrons of mine who like would buy tons of my stuff and then fly me to Holland and I would paint in Holland. And there was this Dutch newspaper who was asking me the same thing. Like, why, what's with the horses, Casey? And I was like down on my all fours and I was doing a demonstration for this group of people. And I was like, what do you mean? What's the horses? I am the horse. Like, look at me. I'm like on all fours here, like a work, a working animal. And also the horses were selling too. It was the thing it was like, I had this whole era where I painted horses and like, People couldn't get enough of it. And I was like, oh shit. You know, I'm kind of like, you know, part of me is an artist, but part of me is like to survive as an artist, I'm like a business guy. And so I was like, yeah, paint more horses, man. This is good, you know, and people criticize me and shit for that, but it's like, I'm still here, you know, and I don't paint just horses now. Yeah, I, I look back on it with no regret now, but I'm, I remember even at the time I was like, oh, I gotta paint something other than these fucking animals. It was like an obsession of mine. Like, I felt like, you know, it was really deep in me, but at the same time, I was like, am I doing this just for money? Am I, you know, I had all this conflict about it. It's only now that I realize, oh, I've been doing this ever since I was a kid. You know, I, I sort of thought that my style developed like, you know, in the 90s, but it actually developed in the 80s. And even in the 70s, I was like, I would sit in front of TV and, instead of doing sports and playing outside, I would like watch Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and like Three's Company and I would like make myself as a character in those shows. And I did like hundreds and hundreds of drawings of like me in Kiss or me in ACDC. And it was always me as a part of it. So I've always been sort of autobio, pop culture merger kind of thing. Partly why I moved to Toronto was this band, The Rio Statics, who, I had written a letter to Martin, the lead singer, 
while I was in Ireland, um, just like when I was 19, I went to Ireland for three months and I asked him if I could join the Rio Statics and he's like, well, we don't need a tap dancer. I said, I tap danced. And he goes, but uh, my brother's looking f to start a band. And so I actually moved to Toronto and started a band with his two brothers, John and Doug. And like, was kind of like the Rio Static stalker for a while where I like volunteered at their record company, you know, was in the band with his baby brothers, like was at his house sometimes, like, you know, while we were practicing and shit. And they were just like, this guy is just everywhere in my life. I'm this extreme kind of person where if I like something, I like dive into it and I, it becomes me, I become it. And uh, yeah, it was like that with the Rio Statics where I just wanted to be near them. They were like kind of, I sort of say they're like my Velvet Underground or, you know, where like I just wanted to be around that level of creativity, you know, because I thought it was like the highest level in the country. Like they're one of, you know, I still think of them as one of the greatest Canadian bands of all time. That's sort of where I found my voice in a way as a painter was, was kind of through them and through painting and going to OCA. I have a weird relationship with OCAD. I took this course called an independent study where you um, basically do your own thing and then you bring in what you do once a month and you get critiqued by these teachers. I was painting all on found materials so I'd go to like the wood shop and I'd take like stuff out of the cutout bin that people had thrown away. And it'd be people's old wood projects and shit that they abandoned. And so I would work on those because I didn't have a lot of money. And so I was just painting on anything I could. Anyway, so I showed up at this independent study critique and I had 80, around 80 pieces. And I thought like, you know, it's been a month, like I got to show them everything I did. And the teachers were like, is this like everything you've done in your life? And I'm like, no, this is what I did for the project. And all the other students were like, what the fuck? Like they had brought like 10 things and stuff. And then like they called a couple other teachers down to look at it. And they were like, this is some freaky shit going on here. This guy's like painting like crazy. And that's when I sort of realized, okay, like I'm not really taking this course. They're learning from me, you know? And that's what happened. They're critiquing me and shit, but they were buying my stuff. And like, I was like becoming a popular artist, like from then on. I remember that same year is when I got with my gallery, Boshi, where they saw the open house at the end of the year and like they signed me kind of like from there. And like I was making a living by the end of that year on my art and had like solo show. And at the same time, while I was at OCA, teachers would hire me for like 50 bucks and they'd go do a demonstration, just like do what you do for the students. And you know, I'd do some crazy shit where I'd like take a branch off a tree and come in and like draw with a branch and just like primal shit, like teaching them like, you know, don't be, you know, don't have these parameters of art school. Like art is like fucking insane. You gotta have fun with it. You gotta like feel your animal self come out and that's when you make something real. And so like the teachers love that stuff. So I was like, you know, I'd get low. And they, the teachers also knew that I didn't have a lot of money. So they'd be like, okay, you can give Casey 50 bucks. And, you know, if, if you want to have him do a demo for your class, you can like, the students will really, you know, soak it up. And so that happened a few times where I was like lucky enough to like be teaching while I was going there. A lot of different things, doors closed and other doors opened kind of situation. And then I realized I'm selling my paintings like by the end of it. And it became my path, you know what I mean? Like it didn't, I didn't look for that path. I wanted to be like a rock star. So like art to me was like the sort of, I don't know, something you do for fun. I never even dreamed of making a living at art ever until I was. And then I was like, holy shit, I can do this for a living. Like I remember when I sold my first painting for a thousand bucks, I was like, okay, this is it. I'm doing this now hard. I mean, years later, I was at this thing called the Outsider Art Fair in New York City and like you have to be self-taught and um, you couldn't have gone to any art school to be in this art fair. It was like super prestigious in this big building downtown. And like I was killing it, making tons of money and shit. And the bigger art galleries that were there for years found out who I was and kicked me out. And they were like, this guy's went to OCA and all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, but you don't know my situation. Like I was like kind of discovered there. 
And so I, my teachers from OCA, like I think the dean of OCA wrote a letter and said, no, Casey is like a special circumstance. Like sure he went to OCA, but like he was his own thing there. And like, you know, I, I forget what they wrote, but it was basically like nullifying my degree. And like, they were like, we've never done this before. Usually people are like, tell them I have a degree, you know, but I was like, tell them I don't, you know, like prove to them, like I, I belong here, you know, in this outsider art world because like I kind of do. I knew that kind of life was like right, you know, knocking at my door. And like, I had all this luck too in the beginning with my art where I would have articles written about me and stuff. There'd be references to other like really big Canadian artists and me and all these circumstances that at the time I had no idea because I was totally, had no knowledge of art and art history, like how lucky I was. But now looking back, I'm like, holy shit, dude, you, you really lucked out. I met uh, Daniel Johnston when um, I used to do these shows with these buddies of mine, the Griffin Brothers down in Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia. It was called Folk Fest. It was this really great kind of folk art show with all these southern artists like Howard Finster used to go to it. That's where I met Purvis Young. Um, yeah and then one day like Daniel Johnston walks in with his sister Margie and uh, has a booth right next to ours and like I was like holy shit that's Daniel Johnston you know. He was like looking at my paintings and saying, oh, I really like this one, I really like this one. Like I was just blew my mind. You have a booth at a, at a trade fair next to someone, you sort of become buddies with them. And so me and Margie were talking and Daniel was, you know, hanging around and I, we all kind of like were trading stuff and getting into each other's work. And I did these really giant things and he always worked small and I was, he was like, maybe I'll work big like this. And I was like, yeah, you gotta work big. It'd be amazing, you know? And we were just like, you know, and I had other friends that knew him a little better. And so they were like, well, come on outside. And so, so. You know, we'd go outside and then like, everyone was talking about what medication they're on. And then we were all swapping meds and being like, I'll take your medication, you take my medication. And it was just like this crazy kind of, you know, atmosphere where he was having so much fun with his sort of like, moderate celebrity at that point like everybody kind of thought he was amazing and he was also doing uh, little concerts at the thing too where he would play whatever song he was working on he would play it over and over and so he'd get out and he'd sing the same song like three or four times and it would be it blew us away that he was so crazy like so cool that he would just do the same song over and over but like other people were like why is he playing the same song and, we were just like, that's awesome, man. He doesn't give a shit about anybody, right? Just one of the coolest people I ever met. And like all my friends who are artists down there too, like all were really in awe of him, you know, and his like sort of like childlikeness and sophistication in his art at the same time was just like off the charts. He was just one of the best people I've ever known. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was so sad because I knew he was on heavy medication, you know, and I wondered how much that had to do with his passing. But also he had a crazy bad diet of like, you know, Mountain Dew and, you know, candy and stuff. So I knew it was a, a number of things, but yeah, he was so young, you know, and it also, you know, scared the shit out of me too. Like he's a chubbier guy too near the end. And I, like I, maybe that's partly instigated me to losing a bit of weight. Like I was like, oh man, I don't want to go like as young as Daniel did, you know? The world lost like a true genius and such an influence on the world, you know? And it's great that people kind of acknowledge it now. And they did when he was alive too. I'm glad he got a big kind of resurgence near the end of, you know, all these bands doing his stuff and taking him out on the road and stuff. My own mental health and struggles with that have been a, you know, art has been kind of my savior in some ways because it's where I sort of recalibrate myself and then become like uh, content again. But if, if I don't paint and don't work, I go through like major depression and I get really low and I sort of realize, oh shit, I gotta get in the studio and get drawing and get painting. And now I always try to keep drawing and keep something going like every day 
just to keep my brain in check. Sort of diagnosed with manic depression when I was 15 years old, and ever since then, knew that uh, you know I struggled with uh, more than most people with um, self worth and um, you know suicidal ideation and all sorts of like serious shit has been a part of my life my whole life. And so now as an adult, I feel I can like relieve that part of my brain by working and by painting. And, uh, and yeah, I put a lot of it into it where it's like, I'll talk about, you know, the pills I take, or I'll talk about, uh, you know, how I struggle. And so, I call it like my magic trick where I like, no matter how low I get, I always have this magic trick I can do where when I'm painting, I lose time and time just shuts off. And there'll be periods where I'll just be like up close to the canvas for like an hour and it'll seem like five minutes to me. And that's magic, like to me, that's the magic. Right?